Today we got what culture Star Wars 20 things you somehow missed in the Mandalorian. Uh, he actually has a video like this for all the Star Wars movies, but um, eh, uh, except the Last Jedi and the Rise of Skywalker, I've reacted to all of the 9 11 he, he's released so far. This isn't part of the series, but I decided to react to it because I need some videos to post for the week I'm going to be gone. So without further ado, guys, let's jump into it with Star Wars, 20 things you somehow missed in The Mandalorian. Even with this Star Wars series sitting as one of the most popular things to tumble out of the galaxy far, far away in almost a decade, there's still a ton of wonderful details and elements within this 24 chapter and counting tale that are yet to be fully discovered by the average Mando lover. Gareth here from What Culture Star Wars and here are 20 things you somehow missed in The Mandalorian. Number 20, Din Djarin's Batman Moment. When taken in Season 3's Chapter 19, The Convert, Mando can be seen trying to evade an incoming TIE squadron in his trusty N1 Starfighter. And it's during that sequence when Din Djarin pulls off a rather familiar maneuver high above the surface of Kalevala, in a way that evokes memories of Michael Keaton's Batman doing something similar in Tim Burton's 1989 feature. Mando fires himself high up vertically into the sky before hovering in the air for just a moment as the ship floats back down to meet the enemy. Now it may just be a a coincidence that this cool as all hell starfighter float hugely resembles Keaton's batwing hover above the clouds, but it's an awesome one all the same. Number I did not notice that. Number 19, Pedro Pascal's Mando injuries were real. Season 1 of this Mandalorian epic ended with quite the bang, as Mando and the gang just about survived an attack from Moff Gideon and his stormtroopers. One poor droid soul who initially didn't manage to make it off Navarro alive, however, came in the form of the Taika Waititi-voiced IG-11, though he did find himself at the center of two of the most impactful moments of Chapter 8, Redemption. On top of ultimately sacrificing himself for his pals, the one-time bounty hunter also helps nurse a battered Din Djarin back to health after nearly being blown to by Gideon. What you may not have realized when taking in this first ever look at the Pedro Pascal face underneath the Mandalorian helmet, however, is that those rather painful looking facial injuries were legit. Pascal had smashed his nose in after walking into a piece of plywood before shooting the scene. So the cut on Jaren's nose in the scene isn't actually makeup, it is the genuine stitched up aftermath of the leading man not looking where he was going on set, the silly goose. Nope. I did not know that, but that's actually like... So crazy. Number 18, A New Hope's Trash Compactor Rod. One of the more obscure original trilogy Mandalorian salutes can be found in the alleys of Navarro. Look closely as Din Djarin moves through the shadows in Chapter 3, The Sin, and right as Mando heads down one particularly dark alleyway, a rather familiar rod can be found propped up against the wall. Those who fondly remember Luke, Han, Leia, and Chewie's attempts to keep from getting squished in a trash compactor during the events of A New Hope will recognize this as the same sort of item Solo and Organa were using to keep the walls from closing in. Number 17, Droids. I did not notice that. Are welcome in Moss Eisley now. The galaxy far, far away became a very different place in the wake of the Empire being seemingly conquered by the Rebel Alliance, with the New Republic attempting to restore peace across the various systems post-Imperial rule. Perhaps the most subtle change felt throughout The Mandalorian, however, comes in the form of the folks seen scooting around Moss Eisley's cantina. In another link to A New Hope, it was originally stated in that film that droids weren't allowed to enjoy the vibes found within this specific watering hole. Jumping forward a few years, though, and droids were very much present in the bar when Mando swaggered into town. It seems as though the anti-droid sentiment had thankfully eased somewhat in the wake of the fall of the Empire. Number six. I did notice that. Dean, is that you, Anakin? When Din Djarin, Miggs Mayfield, and the rest of the mercenary crew put together by Ran to rescue a prisoner being held captive by the New Republic, board the prison ship in Chapter 6, The Prisoner, the group soon barge into a control room containing a seriously outgunned guard by the name of Lant Davin. And it's in the thick of this intense standoff as Mando refuses to gun down the tracking beacon holding guard that a familiar voice continues to pop up throughout. That's because Davin is played by none other than the voice of Anakin in the Clone Wars animated series, Matt. Atlanta, or at least he was until he took a sudden dagger to the chest. Number 50. I did not know Anakin in the Clone Wars wasn't voiced by Hayden Christensen. So I did not know that either. A familiar looking rifle. 
Din Djarin's rifle of choice just so happens to be inspired by one of the most infamous creations in Star Wars history. In what would act as the legendary Boba Fett's debut appearance in this universe way back in 1978, this animated Beskar-wearing eventual icon also came equipped with a pretty sweet rifle during the Star Wars Holiday Special. And when comparing both that Amban Phase Pulse Blaster with Mando's own Amban Sniper Rifle, the design similarities are there for all to see. Once you take a second to get over the sight of disintegrated Jawas and take a closer look at the multi-purpose weapon. Number 14, Thrawn's right- I did not notice that. Right hand man and the other important Shadow Council moments. With the Shadow Council that first popped up in the Aftermath novel trilogy finally making its presence felt on the small screen during Season 3 of The Mandalorian, that remnant of influential Imperial figures being projected before Moff Gideon in Chapter 23, The Spies, contain more than a few easily missed rather vital characters and moments. First up, Gilad Palion is seen talking about the return of Grand Admiral Thrawn, with that captain actually acting as the blue-skinned Big Bad's right-hand man in the Thrawn trilogy of Legends novels. Elsewhere, Commandant Brendan Hux is also present via hologram, with this Imperial personality actually being the father of the same Armitage Hux, who would go on to serve as a general for the First Order in the sequel trilogy. Oh, and the character is also played by Brian Gleason, the real-life brother of Armitage actor Dono Gleason. Lastly, the Project Necromancer Hux is said to be working on, one that depends heavily on Dr. Pershing's cloning research in order to create new leadership for the forces of evil, seems to very much be hinting at the plans that would ultimately see the return of a certain Emperor. Emperor in the Rise of Skywalker. I did not notice that. Number 13, A Bigger Fish. Evil will always find a way to resurface, stormtroopers will rarely hit their target, and there will always be a bigger fish. And this much-loved line uttered by the great Qui-Gon Jinn in the wake of just about keeping from being turned into underwater creature lunch in The Phantom Menace appeared to be lovingly paid tribute to during Chapter 20, The Foundling. After finally taking down the raptor that had stolen one of the foundlings from Din Djarin's clan, said flying menace is ultimately eaten alive by the sort of dinosaur turtle first seen attacking the Mandalorians in Chapter 17, the apostate. And just like that, yet another phantom nod was seemingly thrown into the mix alongside the return of the mighty N1 Starfighter. No I did not notice that. Number 12, we see you Dave Filoni, Deborah Chow and Rick Famuyiwa. During Season 3 of The Mandalorian, the planet Adelphi just so happened to possess a watering hole frequented by a few significant Star Wars creators. During Chapter 21 and 24, The Pirate and The Return, respectively, the likes of Dave Filoni, Deborah Chow, and Rick Famuyiwa can all be spotted enjoying a drink. The creative souls who helped bring the likes of The Mandalorian and Obi-Wan Kenobi shows into existence reprise their roles as New Republic pilots. In the background, when Captain Carson Teva takes a message from Grief Kaga, that wasn't the only intriguing cameo to pop up in this particular drinking spot, though. Number 11, many glo- Um, I did not notice that last one, but I think I'm gonna notice this one. Glorious Rebels nods. In that aforementioned bar on Adelphi, none other than one-time Ghost Crew member Gareth Eberrelios eventually joins Captain Tiva for a quick chat in Chapter 21, The Pirate, blowing the minds of folks who had long been wondering what a live-action Zeb would actually look like. And on top of that Rebels nod heading into the upcoming Ahsoka series, one which is set to star fellow Spectres Sabine Wren, Ezra Bridger, and Harrison Dula, another salute to the much-loved animated show could be seen during a blast through hyperspace in Chapter 17, The Apostate. As Dick Grogu enjoys a hyperspace jump in the N1 Starfighter with his eventual adoptive father, the Force-sensitive Sprog spots the shadows of a pod of Pergil soaring alongside them. Pergil were rather significant players during the Rebels series, with this large alien species being able to fly through hyperspace and ultimately helping Bridges see off the threat of Grand Admiral Thrawn on Lothal. And this brief Mando cameo acts as their first ever live-action appearance, and perhaps the first of many. I did notice that one. Number 10, a subtle rogue squadron video game nod. The video game corner of this sprawling universe was seemingly shown a bit of love during Chapter 19, The Convert. With Din Djarin and Bo-Katan Kryze taking out a few Thai interceptors above Kalevala, the former can be heard letting the latter know that they have two more to go and one more to go as they pick off the Imperial A-holes. Those who spent many an hour cruising around and gunning down the enemy on the acclaimed Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader game will likely recognize these terms as the ones regularly chucked out by your wingmates whenever you are blasting your way through waves of fighters in various missions. For a series as dedicated to respecting and saluting Star Wars past as the Mandalorian, you have to believe Mando's phrasing is more than a coincidence here. 
Uh, I never played the game, so I did not notice that. Nine leaping like a lerman. Overjoyed to see her little guy Grogu as the youngster flips his way into her arms on Tatooine in Chapter 18, The Minds of Mandalore, Pelimoto is quick to wonder aloud who taught the adorable lad to leap like a lerman. Lerman were an alien species who made their presence known in the Jedi Crash and Defenders of Peace episodes in The Clone Wars. With the lemur-like beings having to ultimately decide whether to stick to their pacifist ways or fight back against the invading Separatists on their planet, Mygito. And you guessed it, they're pretty fond of launching themselves through the air from time to time. Number 8, Ahmed. I did not notice that one. Best epic return. Finally finding out who was the person responsible for saving Ding Grogu during the galaxy-changing early stages of Order 66 was one thing, but discovering that said savior was actually Jedi Master Kelleran Beck in Chapter 20, The Foundling, came as an even more satisfying and unexpected surprise for a number of reasons. Those who had watched the Star Wars Jedi Temple Challenge children's game show would have likely instantly recognized the Jedi responsible for supervising Padawans going through their trials. But for those who hadn't had a chance to witness him in action on that 2020 YouTube show, Beck's reassuring words to the youngling as they fled Coruscant likely brought back some unexpected prequel memories. That's because Beck is played by the actor who helped bring the most famous Gungan in the galaxy, Jar Jar Binks, to life in episodes 1 to 3. Ahmed Best, with Ke Ellerin's return perhaps even paving the way for more Best appearances in this portion of the timeline going forward. Number I think he mentioned that in a previous video that I reacted to because I did know that, but I remember learning it from a video from him. So yeah, I did know that. So that's three now. Number seven, Bo Katan's Clone Wars and Rebels references. With season three of The Mandalorian focusing largely on Bo-Katan Kryze and her quest to reclaim Mandalore, said spotlight on the Night Owl brought with it a number of intriguing references to a past many had already seen play out in the Clone Wars series and beyond. Chapter 17, The Apostate sees Bo-Katan reference how her people will do whatever you say when you wave that thing around, in response to Jaren noting how he still held the Darksaber with her own sister tragically being cut down by that weapon by a ruthless Maul who had won that blade in combat, leading to many Mandalorians following him during the height of the Clone Wars. Chapter 18, The Minds of Mandalore then sees bo recall to young Grogu how she knew quite a few Jedi and had fought alongside them. Again, this is a rather loaded throwaway line from Kryze, as Clone Wars and Rebels fans will no doubt remember her various battles alongside the likes of Ahsoka Tano and Ezra Bridger over the years. But for those who perhaps haven't quite caught up on their compelling on-screen Mandalorian history yet, these Clone Wars and Rebels nods are easily overlooked. Number I did notice that. Number 6, the 501st Legion coming to the rescue. Even the massive studio blasting various Star Wars projects into existence run out of unmistakable Stormtrooper costumes every now and again, you know. But when that exact issue popped up while shooting a few sequences in Season 1, that required a lot more Stormtroopers to be present than Dave Filoni and Jon Favreau had originally planned, the creative Star Wars minds landed on a rather cool answer to their problems. The call was made to bring in the 501st Legion to act as background artists for the season's finale. With this well-known volunteer organization who specialize in creating accurate iconic Star Wars outfits, being very much happy to help. No Jedi mind tricks needed. And this easily missed decision to cast the dedicated souls worked an absolute treat, as the 501st crew effectively filled out Moff Gideon's ranks like they'd been preparing their whole lives for this starring moment. Number I did not notice that. Five, it was a trap. Alongside May the Force Be With You and This Is Where The Fun Begins, the iconic utterance of It's A Trap by Admiral Akbar is one that has been alluded to on a number of occasions in the years since its unforgettable debut. The latest on-screen, though easily unnoticed tribute to that piece of Star Wars history, pops up during Chapter 19, The Convert. On the back of being betrayed by Elia Kane, Dr. Pershing informs the Mon Calamari officer beside him that this entire scenario was a trap. Said Mon Calamari figure then pulling a knowing face as Pershing is about to be mind wiped, fully underlines how all involved knew exactly what they were doing here. I did not notice that. Number 4, Legends Continuity Being Reintroduced in the wake of Disney's purchasing of all things Star Wars and ultimately deciding in 2014 that anything that popped up in the extended universe would now be known as Legends and not be classed as canon going forward into the sequel trilogy and beyond, many of these celebrated materials, elements, and stories were pretty much left behind in favor of carving out a House of Mouse extended Star Wars universe. Yet as the years have rolled by, a number of Legends elements have increasingly found their way back into this new canon, with Dave Filoni and the minds behind The Mandalorian in particular 
particular, clearly going out of their way to lay certain Extended Universe references into the small screen tale being told. In Season 3 alone, Dr. Pershing's taxi ride through Coruscant sees his droid driver mention the Sky Dome Botanical Gardens and Holographic Museum of Extinct Animals, highlighting the Mantabog of Malastare exhibit in particular. All of these places and beings were first introduced in Legends continuity, popping up in various novels, maps, and source books. Elsewhere, that very same Chapter 19, the Convert episode, also involves the referencing of certain days in the Star Wars week, with Tong's Day and Bendu Day both also appearing in Legends continuity as part of the Galactic Standard Calendar, which is now seemingly canon after these days live action debut too. What a Tong's Day indeed. Number th I did not notice that. Three, some brilliant Orabesh. The Orabesh writing system can be seen in just about every Star Wars offering you're ever likely to come across, and The Mandalorian inevitably shows off its fair share of Orabesh too, with one of the most notable examples coming during Chapter 9, The Marshal. Those dedicated to translating Orabesh back to what this galaxy calls English spotted how the text hovering around the news hologram confirming the Death Star 2's destruction in a flashback was actually the second paragraph of Return of the Jedi's opening crawl. Not stopping there though, Chapter 22, Guns for Hire also came equipped with one hell of a cheeky Orabesh Easter egg, with at Star Wars Explained spotting how a message on screen in the episode's lab scene actually translated to this means nothing. However, fans may interpret the hell out of it CSI for the win. Well played, well played. Number I did not notice that. To repurpose Stormtrooper armor. Sticking with Chapter 22, Guns for Hire for this next entry, amidst all the celebrity cameo chaos found in this Plazir 15 set episode, it's easy to completely overlook some rather interestingly dressed guards protecting the likes of Lizzo's Duchess and Jack Black's Captain Bombardier in its opening stages. Look a little closer at the Plazir 15 security detail, and it soon becomes clear that said protection is actually sporting repurposed Stormtrooper gear that was seemingly recycled on the back of the Empire's fall. It's noted later in the episode that the planet already contains its fair share of repurposed separatist and imperial droids wandering around. But this background detail further subtly alluded to Plazir 15's penchant for repurposing out of the gates. Number I did not notice that. Number 1. Borrowing from Apocalypse Now the magnificent Carl Weathers has stepped in front of and behind the camera on a number of occasions during The Mandalorian's first three seasons. And with the Grief Karga actor being the director for Chapter 20, The Foundling, the mind behind the magic was able to shed some light on an apparent salute to one of the most iconic movies of all time in the middle of his particular slice of Mandalorian Season 3 madness. As spotted by the brilliant Star Wars holocron on Twitter, a moment that looked to be directly influenced by Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now during said episode, with Bo-Katan pursuing a raptor in her ship as the two are gloriously captured soaring towards the sun was precisely that, according to Weathers himself. The Kaga man put it best. If you're gonna borrow, borrow from greatness. And that's our list. Know of any other things people somehow missed in- Uh, I did not notice that last one. The Mandalorian? Let us know all about them in the comments section right down below, and do not forget to like, share, and click on that subscribe button while you're down there. I have been Foundling Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. May the Force be with you as always. Thanks for blasting on by, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. All right, guys. There you go. I knew four, didn't know sixteen. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Check out this guy's channel and the actual will be in the description below. Make sure to like, subscribe, turn notifications, never miss a video, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.